and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dewar and this is The Sounds of a Medieval City, a walk through Dublin in 1320. This podcast recreates the world of Dublin in the early 14th century. For the next 20 or so minutes, you will be transported back 700 years to the world of late medieval Dublin. Journeying through this city, we will hear the sounds of medieval life, hear the news of the day and meet some of the characters from medieval Ireland. All the events, people and places mentioned in the show are taken from historical records, so this really is a window into the city of our ancestors. I am particularly keen to hear what you make of this show, given it's a little different from normal episodes. So, when you're finished, maybe you could let me know at Irish History on Twitter or Irish History Podcast on Facebook. Your feedback will shape future episodes. Before we go back to 1320, it's probably worth mentioning a few things about the city we are about to visit. It's recovering from some of its darkest days. Between 1315 and 1318, Dublin was devastated by the Scots' invasion of Ireland. Over half the suburbs of Dublin were burned in a fire in 1317, when siege threatened the city. This heavily shapes what we are about to see. The year is 1320 and we are in an area known as Hoggan Green, outside the walls of medieval Dublin. Behind us, Dublin Bay stretches much further inland than it does in the 21st century, so we can hear the sound of waves breaking on the distant shore and the gulls following the fishermen on the nearby River Liffey. Around us, the hallmarks of war are everywhere, just to our south, we can see the blackened ruins of what was once the Exchequer building, the centre of the Norman colony in Ireland, destroyed in the recent conflict. But that is not why we're here today. Let's make our way to the medieval city, the walls of which lie ahead of us. In 1320, the approach to the eastern gate of medieval Dublin, the one which we are about to enter through, the Danes Gate, is along Tengmott Street, In 1320, Tengmott Street is nothing more than a dirt track. There's no stone paving or tarmac. Our feet squelch into the muddy surface. As we near the city, the large edifice of the city wall and the twin-towered gate, the Dame's Gate, rises before us. As we approach, we can hear the sound of rushing water. It's from the River Poddle, which forms part of the defensive ditch and moat around medieval Dublin. In later centuries, this will be buried beneath the modern city. But now, in 1320, it's integral to the city's security. There's also another sound emanating from several buildings built along the River Poddle, outside the walls. These are city mills, using water power to grind grain. This is a highly lucrative business, but if you talk to any of the millers in 1320, they will tell you a tale of misfortune and how they have suffered of late. You see, during the war, the massive Dane Gate was sealed shut for a year, and this heavily impacted the business of the millers. Walking across the bridge, over the puddle, and up to the Dane Gate... We pass between the two immense towers and then under the arch. There are murder holes, poor cullises and other lethal defensive features. But we are immediately distracted by the sounds from the city and a god-awful smell. It is this overbearing smell of decaying food, human feces, animals, fire smoke that strikes us first. Dublin doesn't have any sewage system in 1320 to speak of. Everyone just uses cesspits, basically holes in the ground, which double as toilets and bins. The stench almost makes you gag. This is matched 
by equally strange sounds. While we can hear the chatter of numerous people in the town, animals are very much part of medieval urban life. Dogs bark and chickens peck the ground. However, perhaps the strangest for us is the sound of pigs which roam the city. You might want to be careful of these. They can be vicious. One reportedly ate a child, according to a court case in 1295. Indeed, the city of Kilkenny will ban them from the city graveyard in the 1330s. This almost barmyard-like sound is punctuated by the voices of children running through the narrow medieval streets. They are much more visible in the medieval city than what we are used to. You see, there's no schools, so these children's shouts, screams and laughter can be heard throughout the day in the city. As you recover from this barrage on your senses, you might need to stand aside. While there's no cars, there's equally dangerous horses coming by. Or you might want to watch out for that man approaching, hauling a cart along the muddy street. Getting our bearings, we start to walk into medieval Dublin. The street layout is completely different. A few metres inside the Dane Gate, we come to a T-junction, so we can only turn right or left. We will turn left along Lorimer Street. Here, Dublin Castle rises up before us. This is the seat of the just this year, the chief royal official in Ireland. This year, in 1320, the position is held by Roger Mortimer, the Lord of Trim and the future Earl of March. His deputy is the Earl of Kildare, Thomas Fitzgerald. They are not exactly popular in Dublin though. Indeed, if we ask Dubliners, they'll probably tell us how their mayor had to write to the king to ask him to command Thomas Fitzgerald to try and establish some control over the lands to the south of the city. Citizens are frequently attacked when they go about their business there. Coming closer to the castle, the sound of masons rings through the street. This is from work being carried out on Dublin Castle. The keeper of works of Dublin Castle, Thomas Faucon, has been ordered to carry out repairs that will cost £26, 10 shillings and eightpence. He has hired an engineer, known as Master Robert the Engineer, to oversee these works. He's paid a shilling a day, which is not a bad wage. As we approach the gate of the castle, we turn right and walk along the aptly named Castle Street. In the distance, we can see the other major building of medieval Dublin, the Priory of the Holy Trinity, or what is known in the modern world as Christchurch Cathedral. The worn of streets beneath this massive towering structure are by no means quiet, and getting up to the Priory of the Holy Trinity won't be easy. They're narrow, and the buildings on either side lean out over the thoroughfare, so the bustling sounds of business don't escape. We can see traders and people hawking goods, and the noise echoes through the darkened streets. It's almost claustrophobic. These city streets aren't very safe either. Indeed, this very year, 1320, the Archbishop of Dublin, Alexander de Bicknor, has been railing against beggars in the city. A harsh term for what are presumably just refugees from the war that has ravaged Ireland. De Bicknor is complaining specifically about the rise in what is termed euphemistically as mischief. The sights and sounds of medieval Dublin are pretty strange for us modern visitors. Many of the houses have cottage industries. Indeed, just as we pass one, someone opens a door and inside we can see a large pan boiling away over an open fire. It's hydromel, honey and water, used to make the alcoholic drink mead. But we hear a lot more disconcerting sounds as well. On either side of the street, the thin walls can't hold the sound very well. So we hear a lot of what goes on behind closed doors. Much of it is banal, a child's playing or adults arguing. However, we also hear more intimate sounds than we are used to in the 21st century. Children are all born in the home. 
There are no epidurals and the sounds of women going through labour is commonplace. That's the sound of a newborn baby. Sadly, they only have around a 1 in 2 chance of living to see their 20th birthday. However, we don't have long to dwell on this. We're soon distracted by a procession coming through the street towards us. This is a funeral. These are disturbingly common. Indeed, it might not be the only one you're going to see today. These take place about every eight days in a village of a hundred houses. So in a city like Dublin, with a population of thousands, they're a daily occurrence. As we come to the end of Castle Street, our gaze is drawn towards a massive priory of the Holy Trinity, which is far bigger than any other building aside from the castle. The priory is already three centuries old by 1320, and it symbolises the immense power of the church in the city. High up in its belfry, its bell booms out across the city. As we continue along Boat Street, which runs alongside the Priory, the sound of cannons singing inside echoes through the streets. At the far side of the Priory, we reach the major crossroads in the centre of medieval Dublin. Directly ahead of us is a road that leads to the New Gate. Beyond this lies what was once the largest suburb of medieval Dublin, that of St Thomas. But it has been devastated in the fire of 1317 and is now in ruins. There's also a road to our left which will take us to St Nicholas's Gate and the street beyond will take us to the city's second cathedral, St Patrick's. Around St. Patrick's lies the suburb of the same name, but this is also in ruins. We avoid this part of town and instead turn right at the Priory, firstly onto what is known as Trinity Lane, which leads onto Wine Tavern Street. This is a steep street which leads down towards the river below. As its name suggests, this is where the city's taverns are. Music can be heard along with revelry. But these taverns are also pretty raucous places, illustrated by that fight breaking out beside us. Halfway down Wine Tavern Street, there's another city wall and a large gate which we pass through, the King's Gate. This was once the extent of the city, but during better times in the 13th century, when Dublin had boomed economically, Large tracts of land were reclaimed from the river. After we pass through the King's Gate, we now move on to this reclaimed land from the riverbank. This area of the city is enclosed by its own new wall, and a large tower called Pritchett's Tower lies at the very end of Wine Tavern Street, which blocks our view of the river and docks beyond. However, as we approach the wall, we can hear the sound of the river beyond and we find that it's easy to pass through the city wall here because it hasn't been finished. So we head out onto the docks. We are now on the city docks, looking at the northern bank of the River Liffey opposite us. The most prominent site here is the massive St Mary's Abbey, a Cistercian foundation that stretches for over 100 metres along the river bank. Walking westward along the docks, there are numerous ships, known as cogs, moored on the quayside. If you talk to anyone here, they will tell you 1320 hasn't been a great time for shipping. Indeed, the royal officials in the Exchequer have been trying to send a gift of seven horses to the King in England for months, but they've been stopped by inclement weather and a shortage of ships. Now, they finally have their vessels and they are being fitted out on the docks. Carpenters are building a special deck to haul the horses and an exchequer official has purchased 80 planks of wood and 180 of what are known as spikings or nails for this purpose. Moving along the dock we approach the only bridge that connects the walled city on the south bank of the River Liffey 
to its suburb on the north bank. Walking over the bridge, we hear the sound of more religious singing. Coming in the opposite direction, we meet two cowled figures wearing black cloaks over a white habit underneath, and it's obvious where the chanting is coming from. These distinctive figures are members of the Dominican Order, presumably coming from St. Saviour's Dominican Priory, which is situated on the north bank of the river near the bridge, where the forecourts will be built in later centuries. In 1320, it's heavily damaged though. Three years previously, in 1317, when Dublin faced siege, much stone had been taken from this building to bulk up the city defences. Leaving the bridge behind, we step onto the north bank of the Liffey and into the suburb known as Oxman Town. The main street leading north from here, which will later be called Church Street, is now known as Oxman Town Street. This name arises from Dublin's founders, who were Vikings, or men from the east, Ostmen, or Oxmen. Somewhere in the distance we can hear faint shouts. This is probably as a result of the work of Philip of Colchester, a city hangman, as they are coming from the direction of the street known as Hangman's Lane, which leads to the gallows. Colchester himself was previously accused of murder, but acquitted. Proceeding up along Oxman Town Street, you can hear the sound of a blacksmith working a forge in the distance. Perhaps it's that of William the Smith of Oxman Town, who sold some property to William the Glassmaker in the year just past 1319. Within a few hundred metres of the river, we have come to the limits of Oxman Town and medieval Dublin. North of Oxman Town begins open countryside and large manors or farms many of which are owned by the church. Sadly, however, in 1320, much of this land is laid to waste, having been heavily damaged by the war. To venture out there is another day's journey. So it is here that we will finish our visit to medieval Dublin. I hope you enjoyed our journey through late medieval Dublin. As I said at the beginning, I would love to hear what you think. So drop me a line at Irish History on Twitter our Irish History Podcast on Facebook. Thanks again, and until next time, Sloan.